because of a famine in the land, forced to go into a, into a Gentile nation. Uh, her husband, her two sons, and, and she went to, this, uh, went to Moab uh, just to survive. And probably some of their friends criticized them for leaving Israel. Because certainly not everyone left Israel. And they left, and, and her sons married uh, Gentile women. Which as a God-fearing woman would have been difficult for her. Uh, because the law really required that the, they marry within their own nation. And, and then her husband died. And her two sons died. And she changed her name to Mara, meaning bitterness. And she decided to go back to Israel, and she wanted her daughters-in-law to, uh, to go back home, but they followed. And uh, Orpah followed for a while, and then was convinced by Naomi to leave, but Ruth wouldn't leave. And they get back to Israel, and, and Naomi's testimony is what? Not of the grace and goodness of God, but of the trials and difficulties she's had. And then Ruth goes out of work and she meets Boaz. And she finds favor in Boaz's eyes. Comes home and tells Naomi about it. And Naomi then sees, starts to see God's hand at work in her life. That they have this near kinsman who's shown favor on, and Ruth, on Ruth. And she tells Ruth what to do. And how to approach Boaz. And Ruth does this. And then Boaz uh, becomes the kinsman redeemer. A type of Christ. One who shows us what the Messiah would do for us. And, and what he did for us. And then we get to. Uh, and the, the near kinsman who could have taken all the land and taken Ruth. Doesn't want to deal with that. Because he wants to uh, maintain uh, his inheritance for his children. And not have to spread out any thinner. Uh, let's Boaz tell Boaz you can redeem this. And then that's where we get uh, when we get to verse thirteen in Ruth. So let's just start reading Ruth chapter four, verse thirteen. We'll get down through, uh, go down through the end of the book. It says so. Boaz took Ruth, and she was his wife. And when he went in unto her, the Lord gave her conception, and she bare a son. And the women said unto Naomi. Blessed be the Lord, which hath not left thee this day without a kinsman, that his name may be famous in Israel. And he shall be unto thee a restorer of thy life, and a nourisher of thine old age. For thy daughter-in-law, which loveth thee, which is better to thee than seven sons, hath borne him. And Naomi took the child, and laid it in her bosom, and became nurse unto it. And the women, her neighbors, gave it a name, saying, There is a son born to Naomi, and they called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now these are the gen generations of Pharez. Pharez begat Hezron, and Hezron begat Ram, and Ram begat Amminadab, and Amminadab begat Nashon, and Nashon begat Solomon, Solomon, and Solomon begat Boaz, and Boaz begat Obed, and Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat David. Dear Lord, I thank you again for bringing us here, and I thank you for all you've done for us, and, and that you are doing for us now, even though we don't always see what you're doing and how you're working. And Lord, we ask that you would use this passage to encourage us in these uh, difficult times, Lord, to, to not just trust you because we can see what you're doing, but Lord, that we would trust you when we can't see what you're doing, because we know that you are faithful, and you are always faithful. You are a good God, and you're always a good God, Lord, that you will never abandon us, never forsake us, and Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness. In Jesus' name, amen. So here we see in verse 13, we see Boaz and Ruth starting the family. Uh, his near kinsman, the, the, the elder kinsman, has denied uh, Ruth and, and, want, and wanting, not wanting to dilute his inheritance. And so now Boaz says that Boaz took Ruth and she was his wife. So they were married. And they started their family. He says, And when, uh, when he went in unto her, the Lord gave her conception and she bare a son. Now, isn't that amazing? Uh, the, 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 the miracle of conception, the miracle of childbirth, that, that Ruth was married to this young man uh, previously, Malon, and through that time, we don't know how 
long they were buried, uh, but certainly, you know, it was long enough for conception, and yet she conceived no one. Nor did, uh, uh, did uh, Orpah conceive any, any children. And yet here is Ruth, and, and uh, we don't know how long this took, but it appears that it was a, a short time, that they didn't have to wait long for her to become pregnant. And Ruth bears this son. In verses 14 and 15, we see God here being glorified for his faithfulness. And it's interesting that the Bible, that, that, that God chooses in the Bible to highlight not the praise of Ruth or Boaz, or even Naomi, but the praise of the people who saw this. The people who made these observations, who are watching what was happening in Ruth's life, and in Boaz's life, and in Naomi's life, these are Naomi's friends as they acknowledge God's blessing. He says, And the women said unto Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, which hath not left thee this day without a kinsman, that his name may be famous in Israel. So here it is. They, they, they say, blessed be the Lord. That they're, they're giving him praise because Naomi hasn't been left alone. When it talks about that, that he left this, uh, that, that he hasn't left her without a kinsman, he's not talking about, hey, here's Boaz. They're talking about, here's this son that was born. This son born to Ruth is now this new kinsman of Naomi's. And this kinsman, it says his name is going to be famous in Israel. His name, now, how many of you really think a lot about Obed? You guys meditate on Obed very much? See, Obed's name, claim to fame isn't anything about him in particular. We don't see anything else written about Obed in Scripture except we see him in the ancestry of Jesus Christ. But his, his, name, his claim to fame isn't even really that he's in the line of Jesus Christ. It, it, it is always highlighted that he is the, the grandfather of David. Look at, look at verse 17. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now these are the generation of Pharaohs. Pharaohs begat Hezron, Hezron begat Ram, Ram begat Amenadab, and Amenadab dad begat uh, Nashon, and Nashon begat Solomon, and Solomon begat Boaz, and Boaz begat Obed, and Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat David. It just stops right there. This is an important thing here. We're going to get into that in a minute. But, but uh, among the other things that these uh, women praise God for, and, and, and are using to encourage Naomi who's had this difficult life, who, who thought God had abandoned her. Uh, in verse 15, And he shall be unto thee a restorer of thy life, and a nourisher of thine old age, for thy daughter-in-law, which loveth thee, which is better than thee, uh, than to, to thee than seven sons hath borne him. Here it is. They said, listen, here's this son, this, this child, he's going to be a restorer of your life. What does that mean? Does that mean he's going to save her life? That somehow, you know, she's going to, there's going to be some wild horse bearing down on her and Obed's going to, like, push her out of the way? You know, it could have happened. I don't know. But really, it's a restore of her life in that she thought her life was over. When her husband died and her, her sons died, she thought, that's it. What else is there? She changed her name to Bitter. That's how far she thought her life was over. That all that was left was bitterness. And yet this young man, this, this child is born, this son is born to, uh, to Ruth, and he becomes a restorer of her life. All of a sudden, Naomi now sees purpose in her life. There's something to do. There's there's, there's, there's a reason for her to be there. You know, we, you know, we've had, you know, in our church, we've, we've had families that have been struck by tragedy, haven't we? 
family struck by suicide. Um, different times, I'm sure it's happened previously, before I ever came. You know, uh, things happen. And why does a person commit suicide? You ever think about that? I'm not asking anyone to raise their hand, but have you ever thought about committing suicide? You know, a lot of people do. Now, why do people think about it? Why do people choose to end their lives? Why don't they end their lives when, when, they're, th when they're this depressed? I mean, why didn't Naomi commit suicide? She thought her life was over. Why did she think her life was over? There was no purpose left for her. She didn't see it. She didn't see a reason for living. So she was bitter. And so Obed comes, and when Obed comes, now she suddenly sees, here's her purpose. This young, this young child is the one who's going to give her, restore her purpose in her life. Not only is he going to restore the purpose in her life, but he says he, he'll become a nourisher of thine old age. He says, when Naomi gets old, now, now we automatically assume Naomi, grandmother, old, right? Uh, we don't know how old Naomi is. Uh, we should be very clear about that. We don't know her age. The truth is, we don't know how old Ruth was when she got married. We don't know how old uh, her sons were when they got married. And we don't know how old Naomi was when she got married. Here's what's true, though is that people used to get married a lot younger age than they do now. Uh, you think about it. How many of us are in a generation where, you know, you kind of graduate from high school and within a few years you get married? Right? And now, what's the average marrying age? I mean, before it was like late teens, you know, 19 to 22 I was kind of a late bloomer. I got married at uh, 26, well, almost 26. I was 25, but I was almost 26. I was, I was on the closer to the 26 side. But, uh, you know, it was kind of like, yeah, that, was, that was kind of late, you know. My, my parents were wondering if I'd ever find someone. My dad actually helped try to prevent that. <laughs> but, but, you know, uh, you know, but I was kind of a late bloomer when it comes to marriage. Uh, a lot of my friends were already married. Uh, and then, and nowadays it's, you know, late 20s, early 30s. You know, and, but back then, I mean, it wasn't unheard of for someone to get married at 13, 14, or 15 years old. And we hear that. And how, how many of you have ever felt moral outrage when you heard of somebody now in this day and age get married at 13, 14 years old? You're like, oh, that's just too young. And yet it wasn't that uncommon back then. So Naomi, as a grandparent, could have been in her late 30s, early 40s. Certainly early, early 40s is early enough even in this day and age to be a grandparent. So here she is and she's, she, uh, the, this young man is going to be a restorer of her life and nourisher of her old age. For thy daughter-in-law which loveth thee, which is better to thee than seven sons, hath borne him. She says, listen, they say, listen, here's Ruth's remarkable goodness. I mean, they're... they're there are people we look at and we say, well, this is a good person, right? And we understand, theologically speaking, when it comes to what the Word of God says about the, the, the condition of man, we understand this, there is none righteous, no, not in one. No one is good. God doesn't look at us and say, oh, you know, hey, Mike, he's good. And the only way God looks at me and says, Mike, he's good, is when he looks at me through the lens of Jesus Christ who saved me, who redeemed me. Because apart from Christ, God says, there's nothing good about me. Before I was saved at the age of 17, 
there were people who might look at me and say, well, Mike's a, you know, basically a good kid. But God would look at me and say, there's nothing good about Mike. Now, there is because I have Christ in me. But, the, but we look at people and we see goodness, don't we? We see, we, have you ever seen somebody who you knew was not saved do something good? Sure. It doesn't get them any closer to salvation because our works can't save us. But, but certainly people do some things that are good and, and we can't look at the heart of people, can we? We don't know what's going inside, on inside of people. We don't know what they're thinking, what they're feeling. Uh, but we look at the outward appearance, and, and certainly Ruth's goodness is remarkable here. They, they mention that because, listen, for thy daughter-in-law, which loveth thee. It's like your daughter-in-law, the Ruth, she loves you. And, and when they're talking about love, they're talking about this really passionate love that, that Ruth had for Naomi, that Ruth was going to make sure whatever it took, Naomi was taken care of. And they said this, that she is better to thee than seven sons. She's, Ruth is better for Naomi than having seven sons. Now, some of you ladies are sitting there like, seven sons, that's crazy talk. <laughs> you know, uh, who wants to do that seven times? Well, you know, we had seven kids. Um, and... You know what happens with more kids? The more kids you have, the more craziness in the house. <laughs> and, and you have more craziness. But then when the children grow up, you know, it, it is assumed, we'll, we'll look at that here in a few minutes, it is assumed uh, that, that this is God's plan, that, that these children, when we grow old, are going to take care of us. Is that reasonable? I recognize that our society says, well, you know, parents should not be a burden on the children. Who's heard that before? Parents should not be a burden on children. Maybe some of us have that same thought. Parents should not be a burden to the children. Let me ask you this as a parent, though. Did you think of your children as a burden? Now, I'm not saying did you periodically think of your children as a burden, but did you go through the whole 17, 18, 19 years of living with your children, raising your children, think the whole time, man, this is just such a burden, I can't believe I took this on. You know what? When you love someone, they're not a burden, are they? When you really love someone... I'm not saying that there aren't times when they are a burden. I mean, we all feel that sometimes, don't we? But when you really love someone, they're not such a burden that you think that you just don't want to deal with this anymore. And they say, here's Naomi. This Ruth is better. She's taking care of Naomi better than if she had seven sons that were taking care of her. Here's Ruth. She's doing the work. She's doing more for Naomi than what seven sons could possibly do. That is the, the level of love and compassion that Ruth had for Naomi. And they praise her for that. You see, there's more blessing in one person who's completely and totally dedicated than to have many people who are distracted. You know, you can have, you can, you know, and I'm not saying, when I say, you know, that children need to take care of the, the parents when they're older, I'm not saying that there isn't a time where somebody may need more care than those children can provide on their own, okay? That's not what I'm saying. Because that's possible. It's entirely possible. But, but I will say this, that if you have one dedicated nurse caring for this person, she's going to do a better job by herself than 20 nurses who aren't dedicated. It's the 
same thing in the job. There have been times, and, and, and I've seen it in other people, I've seen it before, where you have one person who does so much work that really overshadows everyone else. I used to say, uh, I, there, there were times when I was at FXI and I had certain people that were working for me, and they were temporary, you know, they, they were temps. And I'd go to my boss, like, I, I really need to get rid of this person. He's like, well, Mike, you, you need more people on your shift already. You can't afford to get rid of them. It's like, if I got rid of this person, I could probably get rid of two more. <laughs> because I need two people to fix what this person messes up. <laughs> you know, one person who's fully committed can do more than a, a larger number of people who are not. And really what we see here is, is this, commitment, uh, this commitment that Ruth had to God and to Naomi uh, playing out and giving evidence of her salvation. We don't often talk about salvation in the context of the Old Testament, but remember this, that people were saved in the Old Testament the same way they're saved today, by looking to the cross, by looking to the finished work of Jesus Christ. They look forward in faith of something that hasn't happened yet, and we look back in faith, something that's already been completed. And, and Ruth's actions here in the life of Naomi really are a practical look at uh, the fulfillment of what Paul said, told the Philippians in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. He says, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And Paul says, listen, you need to work out your salvation. And what does that mean? Some people interpret that. We covered this while we were doing Philippians, so this is going to be reviewed. Some people interpret that as like working out, like you go to the gym and you just get stronger. Make your salvation stronger. But listen, I can't make my salvation stronger. Because my salvation has nothing to do with me has everything to do with Jesus Christ and what He did. And some people talk about, well, this is, this is how you earn your salvation or you maintain your salvation by doing this workout. But we, don't, we can't earn our salvation. It's a free gift that God has given to us because He loves us. And, and I can't maintain what I don't understand. I can make use of what I don't understand. I came in today, I... I turned the key to the lock and, and unlocked the doors. I reached across and I hit the switch and the lights came on. You know why the lights came on? Because I hit the switch. <laughs> it's not rocket science here. But what becomes rocket science is how did we get the electricity? Who here understands how we got the electricity? Go ahead, raise your hand. One, two people. Okay. Does our electricity here come from the nuclear power plant or from hydroelectric? I don't know. Who here understands nuclear power? Raise your hand. See, I don't have to, I don't have, I can't maintain a power plant, nuclear power plant. I can't point, ma maintain a hydroelectric power plant. You know, I, I, I'm lucky to maintain batteries. <laughs> All right. So, but I, I trust when I flip that switch that that power is going to go on. I don't have to understand how it gets there. My understanding of how electricity gets from point A to point B is limited and vastly limited compared to some people. And so when the Bible says to work out our own salvation, it's saying, listen, take what is in you and let it flow out. And that's what Ruth was doing here. As we look at the book of Ruth, her love for Naomi and her trust and faith in God just flowed out of her to the point where she was working harder than seven sons could work for Naomi. And then verse 16, we see Naomi becoming her grandson's caretaker. It says that Naomi took the child and laid him in her bosom and became nurse unto it. Here's Naomi, this is Naomi's purpose at this point. Is she's going to take care of that child. She's going to do what she needs to do to care for that child, to make sure that this child becomes the young man that he needs to be. 
to make sure that this child is kept safe and secure from harm. And here's what's really interesting is verse 17. We look at who, you know, I've told you about how I named our kids. Uh, I named the first three, and then named all the others. I think I, I, had, I, had partial, I had a partial in the third one. Anne's over there correcting me. Thank you, I appreciate it. But Anne chose a second name. I chose a first name yeah, for John. And, uh, and, and I chose names that were had some meaning to them. That, that I thought something they could live up to. Some people choose names because it sounds good, and that's fine too. Uh, but, but who named our children? Anne and I did. Who named your children? Benny? Who named your children? You did? I did. Okay. Okay, who here let someone else outside the family? Who, said, who went to your neighbor and said, hey, can you give me a name for my child? <laughs> See, we all name our children. I mean, it might be the husband, it might be the wife, it might be both of them in collaboration, uh, but we name our children. We would never think of having someone else give our child a name, would we? And yet here, look at what it says. And the women, her neighbors, gave it a name. And they called, uh, they were saying there is a son born to Naomi, so here it is, here's his son. Now we look at that and, and we think, well, Naomi isn't the son, isn't the mother. No, but the, the family connections, yeah, we, we're a lot more detailed in how we identify people today. You know, you know, mother, father, grandmother, grandfather, great-grandmother, great-grandfather. You don't see all that in Scripture. They're just family. And this child is... is, is is in uh, Naomi's family, and, and therefore, even though he's a grandson, he's considered a son, and called his name Obed. And so they named him Obed. Now, does anyone here know what Obed means? Obed is a name that probably none of you would think about naming your kids, and, and you wouldn't name your kids uh, the definition of Obed either, because Obed means servant or worker. So, uh, you know, nobody's going to sit there and name their kid servant. This is my son, servant. And this is my daughter, worker. And worker, Alger, servant, Alger. And, you know, go and, you know, we wouldn't do that. But they chose names, and, and that name is significant because really Obed is the, kind of the beginning of this servant leadership. When we think about his, his grandson, David, the shepherd king, the worker, the servant. He was a doer. Uh, he, he made things happen. And, and then you go all the way to Jesus. The creator of the universe, born in the flesh, who came to die on the cross to save us from our sins. Because we couldn't save ourselves. And while he was here on earth, what did he do? He served. We can, we can look at Obed's name and we can say, you know what, here it is, Obed was a servant. We look in our society as a servant, as somebody who is lesser, don't we? And we shouldn't. You know what God considers servants? Greater. You know, we go out and we, we go to we go out to eat, and the people who are serving us, we should treat them with respect, we treat them with honor, because without them, you're not getting fed. You go to a store, and somebody is serving you, they're waiting on you, they're helping you pick out an outfit, they're helping you pick out an appliance, they're helping you decide what is the best thing to do for whatever situation you're in, you know what, you need to treat them with respect. There's a lack of respect in our society today. 
had a customer this week. Came in on, came in on uh, Monday and needed a new refrigerator. Which, by the way, this is not an advertisement, but the time to buy a refrigerator is before you need it. <laughs> okay? I recommend everyone has a backup refrigerator. <laughs> but, but they came in, they needed a refrigerator because the refrigerator is starting to go out. They found the refrigerator they wanted and said, how much space do you have? This is 36 inches, which is pretty much a standard size for a refrigerator nowadays, but it's 36 inches. Do you have 36 inches? Yeah, that's the exact same size as our other refrigerator. They got the refrigerator. It was delivered on Thursday, which is really lightning fast these days for delivery, and guess what? It was too big. So they came in Thursday, and they, they wanted... Uh, they wanted to uh, get their money back, and it takes 48 hours to do that because it has to come back from the delivery. The delivery truck has to get back to the delivery agency, and then it has to go in the system 24 hours after that. So they couldn't get a refund until, until Saturday. And, and they wanted to get this new refrigerator that's 33 inches wide, but they didn't want to pay for it because they'd have to pay for it without getting that refund first. And so they had to come back on Thursday. But here it is. The refrigerator they found was the exact same price as the one they wanted. And they're sitting there like, well, we should get $200 off. <laughs> well, why? Well, we're going to lose $600 worth of food in our refrigerator because we can't get this refrigerator because they're going on vacation. And they won't be back until the 10th. Because we're going to go on vacation and all of our food's going to spoil. But that's not our fault. And she just kind of went off a little bit. And she said, well, can you count? I'll call your manager. So I was like, well, I can, yeah. So I called my manager. And she said, well, did we do something wrong? It's like, no, that's what she ordered. Then we're not giving her $200. It's like, so I told her, and, you know, but it's, then they came back Saturday. I ended up letting my coworker take the sale because I was at lunch. And to be honest, I just didn't want to deal with her anymore. <laughs> but, you know, People come in and they start yelling and screaming and getting angry. I had a customer once that just started immediately berating me, telling me I have terrible customer service. I spent almost two hours with this customer, trying to be polite and nice to him. And, and he was just, honestly, it was, like, it was like trying to sell an appliance to my father. Because he was the same way. And he finished it all up and got it all done. And they bought the appliance to pay for it. He's like, I just want you to know there's... You know, it's nothing personal. It's just business. Like, it was pretty personal. <laughs> Trust me, if you heard what he said, you know. And, and there's this rudeness to that, that people oftentimes, in America at least, think they have a right to be rude to people who are serving them because, because they look down on them. You know, I'm not a doctor. I will say this, that... People treat me like that if I ever let it out that I'm a pastor, then they kind of backtrack quite a bit. <laughs> but you know what? Me being a pastor should have no bearing on that. It shouldn't matter whether I'm a doctor or a parking lot attendant. It, it shouldn't matter whether I'm rich or poor. It shouldn't matter what color skin I, am, I, I have or what nationality I am. We should be treating people with respect. Even if they're, quote unquote, only servants. But may I say this, the people that serve you, you wouldn't get what you have without them. And businesses are even starting to realize that they need to treat their employees better. Because without their employees, they'd have nothing. And so, when they named... Obed, when they named him servant or worker, it wasn't something they're, they're downplaying him. They're, but, but servants, these people clearly had an understanding that servants were among the most important people in society. I want you to note too that, that she cared for him in his early years, but then he takes care of her in her old age. You say, well, Pastor, where do you see that? That is in the blessing that these women gave to Naomi. Remember, he's going to be uh, uh, a nourisher, in verse 15, a nourisher of thine old age. He's going to care for her. 
God's plan for the family was and always has been that the family care for each other. The parents care for the children, and then when the parents can't care for themselves anymore, the children care for the parents. I, I believe, I, I personally believe that, that we've done a disservice in the world today, not just in America, but around the world, where, where we look at large families as being this weird anomaly. I'm crazy, I mean, even when we only had four children, people looked at us like we were aliens. I mean, some of the comments, I'm not going to tell you some of the comments we would hear. Uh, some of them were shocking to be here in public, let alone, you know, in private. But, uh, you know, I just, I just kind of laugh at some of the things people say because, you know what, guess what? If I only had one child, A, you know, I don't know what's going to happen with that child. But if I only have one child, I'm a pretty big burden on that child when I get old, if that child's caring for me. If I have seven children, now I'm not going to be bouncing from house to house, but if I have seven children and I need someone to care for me, seven children can do that a lot easier than just one. I feel pretty secure that when Anna and I get to a point, if we ever do get to a point where we can't care for ourselves, that our children will do that for us. See, Naomi and Ruth's faithfulness, in spite of Naomi's depression, and in spite of Ruth being a, being a Gentile, their faithfulness to God provided a continuity to the coming Messiah. And that's what we see in verses 18 through 22. Now, these are the generations of Pharaohs. Pharaohs begat Hezron, Hezron begat Ram, Ram begat Amenadab, and Amenadab begat Nashon, and Nashon begat Solomon. And Solomon begat Boaz, and Boaz begat Obed, and Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat David. And we know that Jesus came from the line of David. That is, David is the most significant ancestor of Jesus. Do you know that? Everything hinged after, after the, the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, everything hinged around David. Not only... David in the lineage of Christ, David in the lineage of Christ through Joseph, but he's also in the lineage of Christ through Mary. It all hinged through that. So God's faithfulness will always provide blessing. And when we're faithful to him, he will always bless us, even when, even when we don't see it right away. Dear Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you for your provision in our lives, Lord, for giving everything that you give to us. And Lord, I just ask that you would help us to uh, love one another, to love our families, Lord, to, to be the nurturers and carers that we need to be for each other. And Lord, that you would just show your, your goodness to us, Lord, in, in unexpected ways and help us to recognize that so that we might give you the praise and the glory uh, with full knowledge or even partial knowledge of what you do for us on a daily basis. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Time for the Lord's Supper. Did everyone get a cup? Does anybody need a cup? All right. Turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 if you want to. You don't have to. Uh, we see here uh, the Lord's Supper. And, and I want to be clear on this. Uh, what the what the Lord's Supper is, it, it's not it's not something uh, that we do as a ritual. It doesn't give us any kind of salvation, uh, but but it does tell us. Uh, it reminds us of the death of Jesus Christ. Uh, beginning in verse uh, twenty six, uh, Paul writes this: For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. 
For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. And so it tells us not to take this, partake of this in an unworthy manner. And what that means is, first of all, in order to partake of this, you need to be saved. You need to have received Jesus Christ as Savior. Without that, this cup and this bread has no meaning. But also, we need to take it having our having confessed our sins. Not just once to confess our sins to be saved, but as we sin in life, we need to make sure we're confessing that sin. As God prompts us to, as He reminds us of our sin, we need to confess that. If we are harboring bitterness towards somebody, that's a sin. If, if we, we have something in our life that we know we shouldn't be doing and we just refuse to give it up, you know, these are things that should prevent us from taking this. Uh, or better yet, rather than just say, well, I'm, I, I just don't want to reconcile with this person or, or I just want to keep doing this sin. I won't take it. Just just confess it. Forsake it. Ask God to give you the victory over it. And then partake in this. But if we don't, if we partake in this in an unworthy manner, God says there's a penalty here. He can bring sickness and even death. And so we would just want to take a moment here to, uh, for personal reflection and to just silently uh, confess our sins to God. And seek his forgiveness. And if there's anyone that you need to make right, get right with, I would ask you that you do it at this time. Just a few moments. Lord, I thank you for what you've done for us, for the body that you sacrificed, Lord, the the beatings, uh, the uh, tearing of your skin, your flesh that you endured for our sake, for the blood that you shed for us. And the Lord, I just ask that as we partake in this communion, Lord, this Lord's Supper, that you would help us to remember, and not just for right now, but throughout the month, until the next time, Lord, that we would remember the sacrifice that you made for us, the magnitude of it, and that we would live worthy of being called a child of God. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Again, just pull off a thin strip of plastic on the top here. That will release the, uh, the wafer. It says, And when he had given thanks, he break it and said, Take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same manner also, he took the cup when he'd supped, saying, This cup is a New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread, and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. We do have an offering plate in the back. If you haven't given an offering, please uh, drop it on, on your way out. If you have something for the fellowship fund, I just ask that you uh, mark that, write that on, on the, uh, attach a note to it, write it on the envelope, um, designate it somehow for the fellowship fund, and uh, we'll make sure that that goes in there. Our final song today is you are my all in all. You are my all in all. Let's stand, please.